Thank you, Michael. I appreciate that. And wow, we are so pleased that there are so many of you here. Um, I do want to recognize our international committee. I'd like to just kind of point out that our um, international group here at GRAR started off as a task force at the beginning of this year. And we were just sort of kind of there as support for um, the Global Real Estate Council of Michigan. But this group um, has absolutely been fabulous to work with. We've really been a, a, a good team. Some of the members obviously are here. Um, if you just kind of raise your hand, our international committee members, we've got Brenda, Rick, Jody, Myatt, Joe, Terry, so um, congratulations, you know, and thank you to all of them too. They've all done a tremendous amount of work in putting together this upcoming series for the next uh, six months. So as you know, and you probably saw in the flyer, that once you do complete the full series over the next uh, six months coming here, we're gonna have inter international cuisine um, for each of the next uh, months. I'm not sure exactly what those are gonna be at this point yet, but um, it should be a lot of fun, and you will be able to use the um, GRAR uh, kind of designed low real estate practitioner representative to use in your car, put on your business cards, your marketing material, et cetera. So um, I think it's great. We're really pleased that uh, so many of you are here and have shown an interest in this because you know what? Our community is changing. And as we get into this, um, those of you in this room are truly the ones who have the vision to see what's happening and what's going to change in our community over the next uh, 30 years or so. Uh, I know the topic for this uh, presentation was kind of prospecting, and I know that's something that we all want to do. How do we get started? How do we meet um, some of the international people uh, coming, relocating into our community or who possibly are already here? I wanted to do kind of a general overview on the what, who, and why before we get to the how. How do we meet those people? How do we interact with those people going forward? So um, we'll definitely spend most of our time on the how um, to make those connections and those networks and meet those people. But we're going to focus a little bit briefly here at the beginning on the what, who, and why. So um, first thing I wanted to start with is um, my husband told me this morning. I'm sorry for the interrupt. This will advance your. That will work. Okay. I that was reaching for that. My husband this morning is uh, happens to be a real estate attorney, and he said to me, "You know, Ingrid, you should start off your presentation with a real estate joke." And I thought, there are no good real estate jokes. We're all ethical, professional people, and you know, I've never heard of a good real estate joke. And then I got to thinking, I'm like. But I have heard a lot of lawyer jokes. <laughs> so I was kind of thinking, so here's what I've got. I modified it a little bit to include a realtor. Um, there were, uh, there's a, a very, very wealthy gentleman, and he had lots of money. And he was not of the mind that you could, um, you know, leave all your money behind. He wanted to take it with him. So he was kind of on his, on his deathbed, and he called his uh, three most trusted ad advisors who had helped him over his life and helped him create his, given him guidance and helped him create, a, create his wealth. Um, first, of course, was his, his realtor who had advised him on all of his uh, real estate investments over the years. The second one was his priest. And thirdly, of course, was his lawyer. So the time came and he told all three of them, you know, I'm going to give each of you $100,000. It's in this envelope. And when I'm dying, they're putting me in the ground. I want each of the three of you to toss that envelope and put it in the casket with me right before they, all three of them said, OK, fine, no problem. So the time came, and the man passed away. And, and the three, the realtor, the priest, and the lawyer went to the gravesite, and they were lowering the, the man. And, each one of them threw their envelopes into the casket so that the man could take some of his money with him. And so they closed it. And all three of them are driving back um, in the car together. And they're kind of thinking. And you know what? 
the realtor, of course, being the most ethical, moral of the three, said, you know what, I have to confess. I'm feeling really badly about this. I took $10,000 out of that $100,000 envelope. I feel really badly. I wanted to contribute to RPAC. And I was really upset because, you know, all of my colleagues were frustrated with this new MLS change system and they were frustrated and I just wanted to give something back to all of them. So, you know, he, he was ashamed and of course the priest said, well, I'm so glad you confessed to that because I have to admit too, I took $10,000 out of the envelope he gave me. The orphanage, the heater, the furnace broke. Felt like the kids really, we, we couldn't let the kids get cold with winter approaching. So then the lawyer says, you know what, the two of you, I can't believe, I'm ashamed of both of you. I, of course, I did need some money, and I took my, my uh, Mercedes-Benz broke down, and I needed a new one. So I took the full $100,000 out of the envelope, but you know what, I wrote a check and put it right back in that <laughs> coffin so, uh, for the absolutely full amount. So anyway. But um, I'm going to be sure and tell my husband that one, too, tonight when I get home. So anyway, so the who, what, why, uh, and how of international real estate in Michigan. So first of all, we want to get to the what. Um, what is international real estate? Kind of, a, kind of a big question out there. And um, I will tell you, what did I do with it here? This is published by the National Association of Realtors. It is the 2014 Profile International Home Buying Activity Report. I'm gonna show you a little bit later um, where you can find this online. Um, NAR publishes, publishes this every year, so it's truly a wealth of information about international activity uh, in the United States. What they do, they have, uh, couple of uh, a definition for defining what is international real estate and they define it as sales to non-resident foreigners these are the people who permanently reside outside the United States so they may be Canadians that's where they live most of the time Europeans wherever they're the non-resident foreigners they reside in the U.S. for less than six months. Maybe they come down to their vacation home someplace for le usually less than six months and then go back to their home country. Typically, they vacation, you know, purchase the vacation property or, um, or rental property. Um, they, maybe they use it as an investment. Maybe they um, stay there part of the time, part of the year, and they rent it out the other part of the time. The other um, part of the definition is the resident for foreigners. These are the folks who, um, you know, they've got, they're the recent immigrants. Maybe they've got their green cards, they're here to work permanently um, or for kind of an indefinite period of time. The NAR definition says these are the re recent immigrants and they qualify that as the people who are here less than two years. Um, but they're the temporary visa holders residing in the U.S. for more than six months. That's one definition. What is this definition not taken into consideration? There's a few things. What about the people, the immigrants, who have been in this country for more than two years? Maybe they've been here three years, five years, 20 years, they're immigrants. Um, they still have never purchased a home in the United States, so they're, they're new to the housing market here. Um, other thing it doesn't take into consideration is um, maybe there's second, third generational Americans. Um, maybe their parents came from China or where, whatever country they came from, and now they are buying a home. Well, you know what? There's definitely some cultural implications to those folks when buying a home. They might not speak English as a first language. Um, if any of you have dealt with kind of an Asian client or something, you know, they may be U.S. citizens, they may have lived here for 10 years, but um, I bet you feng shui was kind of important with what um, they were looking for in a house. The other thing this doesn't take into consideration is 
there's a whole big bunch of Americans who are purchasing property overseas. That's not counted in this, in this definition. So any more, I prefer more a broad definition. Basically, any real estate transaction involving an international or cultural component, including any person or business purchasing property outside of their home country. So it could be, you know, a little different foreign language, maybe they're speaking. Um, it could be, I was in Belize last week and looked at some, helping some real estate professional there. He had, he was dealing with some Canadians who were purchasing um, property in Belize. Um, that certainly is outside that kind of narrow NAR definition. So according to, according to this definition, I mean, and this doesn't mean you have to travel overseas. It doesn't mean you speak a second language. But based on this, just by a show of hands, how many of you think you've done, have dealt with an international train? Quite a few of us. Because, and you know what? If you haven't, you're going to, because there's going to be more and more of this um, coming in, in upcoming years. So, um, so that's kind of the what. Let's look at who are the global realtors and their clients, okay? Global realtors, I would say first and foremost, global realtors have a genuine interest in serving their clients, in serving their international and multinational, multicultural clients. The fact that you're here shows me that you have an interest um, in working with people from different cultures. There's a lot to it. Um, we all know how difficult just selling a residential property can be at times just here in West Michigan. You add a foreign language component to it. You add a cultural component. You add something with um, somebody trying to transfer money overseas, trying to get a loan here. There is a lot going on to it. But the fact that if you are, show a genuine interest in helping these people, learning about their cultures, learning about what their needs, um, whether you, you do one international real estate transaction a year or you do 30, um, if you show a general, because you know what, if you show a general, genuine interest in them, you will get referral business from them. You will earn their loyalty. Um, global realtors work with quite a variety of clients. Um, residential and commercial multinational clients. There are a lot of people who, um, you know, the United States is a great place to invest. We have a very stable political system. We have a pretty stable financial system. Um, there's not a lot of risk that if I'm setting up a business here that two years from now or six months from now, maybe the government is going to nationalize my business. So it's a great place um, to invest. Multinational, they're looking for real, they're looking for getting a foothold, commercial people. They're looking to get a foothold. They're looking maybe to open up their business in West Michigan um, or across the country for that matter. When they come and they set up their businesses or open the branch of their company, who's going to come and follow? It's their workers. So we as realtors need to help provide housing to the, um, to the residential clients. Um, who else do global realtors work with? University and research center faculty. Gee, do we have a research center here, a globally renowned research center here in Grand Rapids? Van Andel Institute. Do we have any universities here? Uh-huh. Um, global realtors work with, with, with those folks too. Um, and you know what? With the university, they may, it may be faculty. 
I went to the Grand Valley State University annual fund year, fundraiser a couple years ago, and I happened to sit at a table with the dean of the engineering department. And you know, I was talking to him a little bit about international real estate. He said, Ingrid, you know what, you're spot on. The last five out of six engineers that I hired were from overseas. It's not just the faculty, it's the students too. More and more um, parents of college-age students are looking for, instead of putting their children in a dorm, they look at the uh, United States as a good investment for single-family home. They can live there, it's safe, um, and they're looking for that. They look at it as a good way as an investment. Resort and second home property, certainly. Um, certainly those, there are those people coming here to West Michigan to, for a change of job, what have you. But there are certainly uh, people who are coming here. You look at the lake shore, I mean, there are people coming to rent, to buy. Our West Michigan, our resorts, our golf communities, um, lake property, very, very desirable for um, second home resort and second home property buyers. Retirement homes overseas. Um, we'll talk a little bit later, but our global population is aging. And a lot of people are concerned about the cost of living here in the United States or in Europe. So they are looking for places that cost of living is, is less expensive. And that can be even right here in West Michigan. Bilingual, bilingual or multicultural individuals. Again, this doesn't have to be somebody who is moving from China. They lived in China last year and now they're moving here. It can be those second and third generation people who certainly have, you know, I'm sure you've dealt with it before too. You're dealing with some clients and they're talking away in their whatever language it is and you kind of sit there and you go, I wonder what they're saying. I wonder, do they like the kitchen? I don't know. But um, there, that also is definitely part of uh, international business. Because they do have um, these multicultural individuals. They have, they have specific needs. Maybe they still have two or three generations um, of family members living with them. Maybe it's feng shui. I dealt with an Indian uh, gentleman a couple of years ago, and I don't, I don't understand exactly what it was, but something based on his birth date and the time of day he was built, the master bedroom had to be in a certain position, and I thought, okay, well, we'll, we'll work with that. <laughs> so, so they do. They, um, they, they have a lot. They have a... You know, a variety, there's a lot of different people out there and they've got a lot of uh, different needs. So what are they? They seek second homes in the U.S. Certainly we've heard about all the Canadians and maybe the Europeans who've been buying property in southern Florida for warm climate. Think about, think about where we live in the northern hemisphere. You know what? The Southern Hemisphere, their seasons are opposite of ours. So maybe they don't want to deal with the sweltering heat. Um, maybe they want to come, or Mexico, maybe they want to come to Michigan because it's too hot in Mexico during the summertime. So they want to come to Michigan where the climate is maybe a little bit cooler. So they, it, can go, it can go both ways. It's not just all the Northerners moving to Southern warmer climates southern warmer climates. Recent immigrants, um, part of their needs, they see buying a home truly as part of the American dream. This is big to them and um, while initially low, recent immigrants, their housing levels, they might not purchase quite to what typical, you know, U.S. born um, people are buy at the same rate, but over time, you know what, their housing rate is higher than what it is for U.S. born people.
thing with another thing about with clients with um, a variety of the recent immigrants, think about what their needs are. If they're coming from a different country, they still may, like I said, may have multi generations living in the same house. But even if they don't, they may still have friends, family who want to come and visit. So they may need that extra extra bedroom or that extra bathroom and and um, whatever. So it's it's a you got to ask the questions to really find out what they need. Like I said, second and third generation Americans with specific cultural needs, they can be U.S. citizens. They're born here. They could live here. I dealt with some client, very good clients of mine. they have born here in the U.S. They speak fluent English, perfect, but their parents are Chinese. They also speak Chinese. <coughs> and um, there was definitely some cultural concerns and um, with what they needed when they were buying their house. So feng shui being, being definitely one of them. Uh, foreign b businesses seeking U.S. market. Again, that's certainly an opportunity for those of you if you do anything with like commercial um, development. But again, as I said, the foreign businesses, if they're purchasing a commercial property here, they're going to be bringing their employees, they're going to be bringing them here. Now, whether they stay for six months or whether they're here for six years or for, um, you know, permanently, they certainly have certain needs. And I wouldn't discredit, you know, maybe helping some of these foreign businesses, even if their employees maybe a CEO or somebody may be coming for six months. You know what, they, you can certainly help them find rental property, you're gonna establish that relationship. The next person who comes over may be staying, may be purchasing home, may, be, may decide not to rent and may, may decide to stay. Um, U.S. citizens seeking property abroad. I mean, this whole thing wasn't even in this um, report really doesn't get into too much of, it's hard, kind of some hard numbers to track. So I think NAR struggles with that a little bit. But there's a whole big group of US people who are purchasing property overseas. And it's not to, they've got unique, unique needs too. Maybe they want to go back to um, wherever their cultural or origins are. Maybe they want a second home in the Caribbean or at Mexico. Um, or some someplace such as that. I mentioned kind of multilingual cultural individuals. Um, foreign investors. As I said, we've got a really stable, predictable economy and political system here in the U.S. Not every country in the world, we're, we're fortunate, not every country in the world um, has that. And people are looking for a safe place to put their money where they know the government isn't going to seize their property or seize their business. There's free flow of capital all over the world. And investors will seek their highest uh, rate of return, what they can, given you know, equivalent safe investment. So, Renters, I talked about that too. You think. You know what? What isn't it here? We sell houses. What about renters? Well, you know what? Many property managers and rental companies will cert could pay a referral fee. Um, I was talking to some of my colleagues who work out uh, up in Ludington, and every year they get renters coming to uh, the Lake Shores, West Michigan Lake Shores, to rent vacation property during the summertime. Repeat renters coming back. Well, you know what? Maybe you work with those property managers. Maybe you help um, somebody uh, advertise their house for rent. And you know what? Next thing you know, may you convince them to buy their second home or their vacation home in West Michigan instead of just continuing to rent. So there's certainly opportunities um, out there. Oops, what did I do? So. Um, we did the, the what is and the who. 
So now, why do we want to get involved in this? Okay, good question. Um, according to this NAR profile of International Activity Report, um, we're going to go through some national statistics, okay? This is for the whole U.S. NAR's got a ton of global resources who are looking at global trends, who are putting together this report annually. What are some of those statistics? Um, according to the uh, International Home Buying Activity Report, this is a billion multiple billion dollar business in this country. Multiple billions. Anybody want to take a guess as to exactly how many billion? 92.2. Was that? Very good. Okay. You're paying attention. That was not, nobody looking at your cheat sheets going forward, okay? So yes. Um, it is. It's 92.2 billion. Billion with a B. I put that in red because it's important. Um, anybody want to do the, by the way, anybody want to do the commission rate? Uh, what sales commissions are on 92.2 billion? I don't know. Pick a four, five, six percent. I don't know. I picked, I did the calculations. I was curious. So even at a five percent, let's say five percent commission rate, that's $4.6 billion of sales commissions that are out there. You know what? I don't care even if I have to share half of that with all of you. That's okay. We can do that. <laughs> um, that's up 35% from last year. Uh, 68.2 billion for the previous year. By the way, this report is published um, usually every summer. It goes from April to um, May, so this came out, it was the, oh, excuse me, the 12 month period ending March 2014. So it was April 2013 going through um, March, of 20, March of 2014. That's a pretty astonishing um, 35%. What's, what do you think responsible for that? You know, that's a good question. Um, I will tell you, we'll see a little bit later. The Chinese are purchasing a lot of property. There's been a big, big, big increase in what they're what they're purchasing, and you know they're, you know, obviously their economy is going strong, but they don't have the safe, you know, same political, economic systems that we have. They're sending their kids over here to college. They're looking at it as a safe investment. They are also looking at it as um, kind of a, you know. A a prestige sort of thing. It's sort of the nouveau ri riche. You know, they've now all got this kind of money, so they're investing in, you know, big houses here, the luxury <laughs> goods, that sort of thing. Plus, they've heard about how depressed our market was. So they it heard like an opportunity. Absolutely. Um, last fall, or Detroit. Um, you know, NAR keeps some statistics on which countries are searching for um, property in the U.S. and where. Um, Detroit, because property values are so low in Detroit, there's a lot of people. I don't know how many exactly are buying in Detroit, but they are, you know, they're looking at, you know, you buy a house for $10,000 in Detroit, and there's a lot of people who are looking, um, China in particular, and um, who keep looking at Detroit as, as an investment properties. And e exactly, that's, I think that's very true, is our market um, you know, ha had a little bit of decline. I think now that's, that's picking back up. And they're, they're seeing it as a- buy Detroit and build cars there. They could. And well, maybe that would be a good idea. Who knows? <laughs> um, but, that it, it, it is. There's a big, big increase. The previous year, it was last year. It, the it, the market did dip a little bit. So the previous year, it was I can't remember maybe 78 billion or something like that. But um, so there was a little bit of a dip the previous year. But do you have to split all 
the 35 percent or the increase by area, like you know what state that would be? Is it East Coast, West Coast, Middle, or is that? There is, there is, and. Um, I will, you know, refer you to this. I'll show you how you can get access to this report a little bit later on. But, you know, okay, we're West Michigan. We're not California. We're not Florida. I mean, they, Calif you know, California, Texas, Arizona, Florida, <laughs> New York, Washington. Um, those are, you know, there's a lot of big, you know, it's a tech industry which is there. You have high tech there, right? So that's probably where engineering, et cetera, demand. Is. You know, it, it, it could be. It could be, you know, who knows? New, you know, New York is a big financial center, so people are, um, you know, buying there. Of course, the West Coast with um, their sort of, you know, population diversification, you know, as it is right now, there's a lot of Asians, so they may tend to um, kind of congregate where, um, they already have friends or relatives or what have you. So, um, yeah, but this, if you really want specifics, it'll show you state, um, probably the top five um, states and where they are coming from. Texas is a big one too. So, but good question. Uh, roughly, you know, this 92.2 billion is roughly 7% of the total U.S. existing home sales, that's pretty big. I mean, do we want, we as realtors here, do we want to ignore 7% of the market that's out there and not be experienced enough or culturally sensitive enough or know how to interact with these people or how to market? There's a big opportunity right there to capture those people. It's one in every 12 to 14 homes in the U.S. right now is purchased by somebody from overseas. There's definitely, and that number, I think it's, gonna, it's going to continue over the next few years. I talked about those two um, kind of definitions according to the NAR uh, report. Oh, I keep hitting that button. Um, 45, roughly equal to the non-resident foreigners and 46.7 billion to the resident for foreigners who, who purchase here. So. This excludes, of course, not captured in that, are the people, U.S. nationals purchasing, purchasing outside the U.S. So. Uh, by the way, of those foreign sales, don't look at your sheets because it's probably on there. Don't look. Average sales price. Um, what's it here in Grand Rapids, West Michigan right now? 150 something or other? Okay. Nationally, domestic clients, the average sales price is 247000 Don't look at your sheets. Oh, it's not on there. Good. Okay. Take a guess. What is it for people buying international property? International folks buying property here in the U.S. What's the app? Take a guess. 300. 300. I hear 600. 200. Some say it's a little bit low. Some say it's a little bit higher. 396,000 is the average. I don't know about all of you, but I'd rather sell a $396,000 house than a $247,000 house because it's probably going to be more money in my pocket. Now that might mean a little more effort because I've got some cultural things to deal with and I may have some financing things to deal with, but, um, but that's the average. Methods of financing, as I said, there could be, there can be some challenges. My, my yeah, 60% are cash. Yeah, I, I would love to be able to deal with a $400,000 purchaser who's paying cash that's going to be more money and quicker money in my pocket. So, um, why is it 60% cash? Well, mortgage financing can be somewhat difficult here. Um, we're going to we're going to have a speaker coming in or talking in December, talking specifically about uh, financing. But really, some of the, the the qualifications that we have difficulties in documenting mortgage requirements. 
uh, lack of US-based US credit histories um, can cause some certain problems with buying a home here. But like I said, we've got a speaker lined up, I think it's in December, who's going to help us and guide us with some way, ways around that, OK? Um, also, culturally, there can be some different thing, different attitudes in borrowing. If you come from a, maybe a European country, used to putting 80% down, you've got a lot of cash. That's what you're used to. So maybe you buy a less expensive house and you pay cash instead of trying to finance part of it. Or um, certainly from a Islamic Muslim community, there's some um, concerns about borrowing. So how can you work around that with maybe some um, other financing methods? So, by the way, where you know who are where are they buying these properties? Um, Forty-five point six percent of the properties that the international buyers are purchasing are in suburban areas. So it's not you know, downtown New York City or downtown Los Angeles or San Francisco. Some of it, 45, but um, roughly half, 45% are in suburban, sub -er, suburban areas. Not only that, 68.2% are single family homes. So they're not just, certainly there are some investors who are buying multifamily properties, but most of them are buying single family homes. Okay, don't look at your sheets. It's blank. Is it blank? Where are they coming from? All right, so who wants to guess? Where are they coming from? Canada. Okay, here, Canada, China. I heard somebody said Russia. The UK. Germany. Mexico, France. Did you have something that you wanted to? No. No? Um, so, <laughs> Sweden. Sweden would be great because, of course, being a Swede, I, I like that. But unfortunately, Sweden did not make the top five. Top, fives are, top five are right there. China, I heard China, Canada, India. Did anybody say India? OK. Um, the United Kingdom. Interesting today. We'll see what happens with the United Kingdom. Do we all know that Scotland is voting for a possible referendum? Who knows if the United Kingdom at the end of the day today will be uh, as we know it. China. I mentioned before, you know, why the increase. China over last year increased their um, total um, purchases from 10 billion last year to 22 billion in this most recent market report. Um, they are uh, by far, in terms of dollar volume, purchasing the most, um, the highest priced properties, and that's the most sales. In terms of number of transactions, it's Canada. The Chinese typically are purchasing in like little higher priced markets, so um, that's why they're a little higher. Canada, 13.8 billion with 15% um, of the total transactions. India and the United Kingdom, five, both of them about 5.8 billion, rough, uh, representing about 6% of the sales. And Mexico, 4.5 billion with about 5% of the sales. So, a little bit more about national st statistics, immigration trends. Let's talk about this for a minute because the U.S. population is going to add over a million, a hundred million people by the year 2050. What's the U.S. population right now? 316 million. It's going to be over, it's going to be projected to be 438 million in the next 35 years. Where are these people? How's it, how's that happening? Well, one thing, pardon me? It's, we're all getting older, that's one thing, okay? <coughs> Going back to about those retirement folks looking for properties overseas, there could be an opportunity. Um, but immigrants are gonna be coming at an increasing rate. Right now, we've got 
maybe 1.6 million immigrants coming to the United States annually, that amount is going to, they're going to come faster. Um, in another five years, they can be coming at 1.7 million a year. Another 10 years, five years, 1.8. By 2040, 2045, over 2.1 million immigrants are going to be coming to this country each year. Whites are going to be a minority. Um, they are be long before 20, 2050. So they're coming. The Latino population is going to uh, triple. And by 2050, 19% of the U.S. population will be in immigrants. You know what, I think we shouldn't be afraid of rising numbers. I'll tell you up, you know, up front, <laughs> diversity adds value to our community. We're all here, we're culturally, you know, get the, get the word out. I'll tell you from my personal experiences with the international people that I have met and the people from different cultures and backgrounds, if you make an effort to get to know them, you can reap so many rewards. I've got friends from all over the world who <coughs> I could call them up and I could stay at their house next week if I wanted to. And the culture of things, it's a matter, it's a matter of education. We don't need to be afraid of, we don't need to be afraid of it. It's a matter of educating ourselves, accepting it, embracing it, and not being afraid of it. Because, you know, because it's going to happen whether we're, anyway. So, just to put that in perspective, um, the gr last great wave of immigrants, when our grandparents and great-grandparents came from Germany and Italy and Ireland back you know, at the turn of the century, the highest percentage of um, immigrants for the U.S. population was 14.8%. Look at where it's going to be by, the, by 2050. So roughly one-fifth of our U.S. population is going to be immigrants. No, oh, now what I'm doing? Uh, oh, good grief! Julie, I pushed the wrong button. Let's. Go. Sorry. All right. You see, this is a good recap for you. <laughs> um, there's those. All those. All those. Okay, variety needs. We got that. Okay, keep going. Why get involved? National statistics. I bet you can all tell me who the top five um, countries are. Are you ready? Here they come. Oh, nope, not yet. Ha ha! Do you all remember? There they are. <laughs> all right. Um, State of Michigan. Okay, that's national. Let's get down to State of Michigan um, because it's, it's happening here too. Another report also published by the National Association of Realtors. This one came, the most recent one came out in October 19 or 2013. Uh, <laughs> NAR put this out. They do a state by state. So if any state you want to know in our country what the international uh, real estate activity is, you can find this at uh, NAR global um, or realtor.org global. I'll show you where to get that. But um, so they're looking at you know they're looking at Michigan and what you know what do we what do we have going on here? So first thing, admitted immigrate admitted immigrants. These are the kind of the permanent residents here. Every you can see from 2003 all the way up to 2012, which is the most recent data we have. We've got you know. We've had a couple spikes, but roughly about 17,000 immigrants are coming to the state of Michigan each year. Roughly half of those go on to become U.S. citizens. That's, I don't know about you, but that was far more than what I thought. Um, home, this is something interesting. Those immigrants, those 17,000 immigrants who are coming here, and what are they doing? You know what? They're going to get their citizenship and they're buying homes. If you look at the light colored, that's the U.S. Michigan is the blue. Look at, we're better than the national average. 
on home ownership rates. Uh, if you're born in the U.S., 66% of you nationally will buy a house in the U.S. If you're living in Michigan, that amount jumps up to 70, almost 72%. Look at the national, naturalized citizens. That amount goes up to 77. That's higher than the national average. Um, there's tremendous, goes back to being part of that American green, dream. So if we can get connections, make relationships with those people who are coming here, maybe they're not permanent citizens, but we work out and get into their communities, then they're the ones who are going to be buying houses. So. Okay. No looking at your sheets. Hope it's not on there. Okay. Top five countries of origin for Michigan. Are you all looking? Don't look. Okay. Where are they? Take a guess. Where are they coming from? Canada, Mexico, China, India, Saudi Arabia. Somebody said, what else? Jordan, Yemen. Anybody else? You got, you got most of them. That's the first flag. Where's that? Iraq. Iraq. Based on, this was from 2012, 3,000 came from Iraq. Think, yeah, think of Detroit. Yep. Next one, what's that? What flag is that? Somebody said it. India. Okay. Third, somebody said this when I heard it. We, where is that? A little over um, almost 1,200. Next one? China. 950. Okay, this last one, I didn't see this one come. Who can tell me what flag, what, what country is that? Brazil. Not Brazil, but it starts with a B. Burma. Burma. Bangladesh. Burma. I don't know about you, but I didn't see that one coming. So I'm not, not sure where they are, but. So that's Michigan, that's across the state of Michigan. That's from this, uh, this report. So West Michigan stat, we've talked about national statistics, um, state of Michigan, what's going on right here in Kent County? What's, going, what's happening here? So this information came from, um, again, in this Michigan report, maybe you don't work necessarily in the Grand Rapids area, but they've got information on Detroit, Lansing, each of the Kalamazoo marketplaces that you can get some of this data uh, specifically. Over 60,000 people identify themselves as Hispanic or Latino. 15,000 in Kent County identify themselves <coughs> as Asian. Over 44,000 people here in Kent County are foreign born. And nearly 70,000 people speak another language other than English at home. Kent County, I looked at the, I was trying to figure out what the population of Kent County itself is, and it's a little 600 and some odd thousand. If you speak, we've got uh, over 10% of the people in our county right here speaking English, um, speaking another language besides, en besides English. Obviously, I'm not speaking English real well today. Um, right here at home. So you talk about language, cultural implications. It's right here. And we looked at that, those immigration statistics, what's going to happen nationally, it's happening here too. So, so okay, we covered the, the what, who, and the why. Now let's get down to the how. How do we meet these people? How do we make connections? What do we do with them when we run into them? Where do we go from here? So, four steps, four simple steps. For take inventory of your interest, expertise, and resources. Identify your niche, make a marketing plan, and know the people you are working with. You know, every training seminar and things we go to, we all get these all great ideas. I'd be happy if each one of you took one idea from the next section, just one, and implemented. Actually do something with it. 
The biggest mistake I think people try to do in getting into global or international real estate is trying to do it all. If you focus on one thing, become the expert in that area, you'll have, then you can kind of branch out and go from there, okay? But pick one thing that, that catches, your, catches your eye and go from there. So, first step, take inventory of interest, expertise, and resources. Do you speak a foreign language? That's, that's a natural one. That's an easy connection. Um, maybe if you're like most of us, you don't know a foreign language. Maybe you know a few phrases. I certainly don't consider myself fluent in Japanese, but I can say, Ohio gozaimasu, odenki desu ka? You know, hi, how are you? Are you okay? Um, or domo arigato. You learn a few simple phrases. Uh, people coming to our country, they don't expect us to know their language. We're fortunate in the fact that um, we do speak English and English is taught you know, pretty much all over the world. So we're very fortunate with that. But you know, building that rapport and making that connection with your international people that you meet, even if you just learn a few phrases, hi, how are you, um, thank you very much, please, what have you. And of course, when you are traveling abroad, the most important thing you want to learn is where are the bathrooms, so, in that foreign language. So, it, uh, having at least a little bit um, is important. Assess where have you traveled? Um, where have you been? The countries you visited, how long have you been there? What do you know about them? Okay. You know what? If you're like, most of us, maybe you don't even, you don't speak any foreign language. Um, and maybe the most exotic place you've been to is the foothills of Kentucky. You know what? You can still, uh, you can still evaluate what experience you do have. Do you specialize in investment properties? You know what? If you've got, if you specialize in investment properties here, that's a dollars and cents thing. That's very easy because you know what? International investors are looking for that same dollars and cents. Now you, there's going to be some other issues, currency fluctuations, tax implications, um, et cetera, but that's a basis. Take, take assessment of what you do know. Resort or second homes, if you specialize in that, again, a very natural place to, to start. What networks and connections do you currently have? Do you belong to any cultural groups right now? Do you belong to the Chamber of Commerce? Um, do you have referral connections? Do you have referral connections from other real estate professionals around the world? Do you have other um, referral connections from you know, people from other states? Maybe you want to decide you're going to specialize in French and European and you develop this great website, and you start getting some calls. Well, you know what, maybe they don't want to buy a house in West Michigan. Hopefully you can convince them that they do. But do you have the referral connection with a good somebody you trust, somebody who's pr uh, preferably a CIPS, a Certified International Property Specialist designation? They will take good care of your clients for you. So. Um, you know, other things, I mean, look at, your, look at your interests, too, I would say. Maybe you don't, you know, you haven't traveled a lot of places, you don't speak a foreign language, you know, you're kind of looking at that and, you know, what do you want to do? But, um, I don't know, maybe you don't speak Japanese, you haven't been to Japan, but you really like sushi, you know? <laughs> there you go, there's kind of a, at least it's a start. You can go to your favorite sushi restaurant and start, you know, networking with some of those, those people. So, um, next thing, um, trying to identify your, your niche. Um, there is, what do you, you know, what do you want to do? <coughs> do you want to work with one particular ethnic community? Do you have the family, you know, maybe the background, maybe you've traveled to a particular country um, and you decide I want to be the expert with Germans or I want to be the expert with 
Chinese, whatever. If it's a particular ethnic community, if that's the route you want to go, good. Work those networks, meet the people, and become the expert. Because you know what? If you're, if you're the go-to person in that ethnic community, you will gain those people's trust and they will refer business after business. Because if they come that first generation, then their kids come, maybe family come, and then their friends come or somebody else come. They're all connected. They will refer you. Um, you can become the expert um, in that uh, ethnic community. Relocation of foreign workers. You know, we think about, OK, um, all right, we've got some foreign companies in West Michigan. According to the Right Place program, there's over 135 different foreign-owned companies in West Michigan. Foreign-owned, OK? That doesn't include the non-foreign-owned who bring international people here. At Herman Miller, the cardiothoracic surgeon from the UK to Spectrum, the uh, engineers from India who joined the um, Grand Valley, um, the research professional who came from Sweden to the Van Andel Institute. So there's people out there, they're relocating here, they want to do. What can I say? How do you meet them? How do you get involved, get connected? You can search out those 135 different um, companies that are foreign owned. I'd say meet with their human resource directors, sit down and talk to them, say, hey, I want to, you know, your company is from Italy. Um, I've got a little Italian family background. If there's anything I can do as you're relocating workers here, whether they are coming either just for rent, you know, to rent for a while or temporarily, they still need housing. And if you can show them that you are the service person to be able to help them, uh, you will get, you will earn their business. Um, part with that too, you want to ask a lot of questions with these foreign workers, people who are coming to relocate here. Where did they live? What type of housing did they live in when they were coming from their original country? If you've got somebody coming from Italy, for example, who lived in a three bedroom flat in Milan and took the bus and the train everywhere and um, pretty much everything was in walking distance. You might want to push back a little bit with them if they say, I want a two-acre property out in Ada or Cascade. Are they really going to be happy that I So I would say ask a lot of questions. Again, it goes back to kind of building that rapport. Now, ultimately, they may decide that's where they want to be because having a big, you know, 4,000 square foot house on two acres that's what, you know, that may be it, but, um, but help them. Along with that, the one thing, one of the biggest reasons that international employees don't stay in the community is not because the worker, the employee is not happy. He or she gets up, goes to work, does his job. You know what it is? It's the spouse. So if you can provide some sort of service to the trailing spouse, hey, what are you interested in? Oh, you like to paint. You know what? Hey, there's an art group over here. Or you want to do yoga or what have Help with their kids. Where's the, what are dance schools or soccer programs? If you can provide that extra personal service, again, you will get their report and get their, um, get their repeat business. So other things you can help them with, getting driver's license, school activity, helping to arrange school tours, um, what have you. You will make them follow up. Once you sell the house, maybe every couple weeks, hey, how's it going? Do you need help with anything? Um, maybe they need, you know, like I said, driver's license or utilities or cable or who knows. Um, I think getting yourself out there and really showing to like the human resource directors, that, hey, I can provide these services. So not only is your employee going to be happy, but I'm going to make sure the spouse is happy because that's going to make your employee more productive, more likely to stay, and not decide two years, hey, I'm going back home. 
also. Inbound investors, again, I've said this before, there's a lot of people looking for um, investment property. Maybe they come, they stay for, they want to stay part of the time, but also maybe run it out part of the time as well. College students from foreign countries. Again, um, parents are more and more looking for housing opportunities for their kids while they're going to, to college here. We've got Grand Valley, we've got Michigan State Medical School, we've got, um, you know, Calvin College. We had a um, director from uh, Calvin College who, he was the international recruiter for students. So he know, he's out there proactively meeting with these people and trying to get people from around the world to come to school and come to college right here. Meet with the, get out there, meet with the um, housing directors at these colleges. I met with a, I was getting a new Verizon cell phone the other day. And the guy I was talking to, he had a you know, different name. And I was telling him I need, you know, international, some sort of international capability on my cell phone. And we, so we got to talk and he said, oh yeah, I'm from Trinidad. I'm like, really? So he came up here, went to Cornerstone to college. That was seven, year, seven years ago. He stayed, he's buying his second house here now. So they're out there, if you can connect with these people. Renters, again, as I said, resort, the lakeshore properties, even if it's um, temporary workers who need temporary housing. You go to these 135 different um, companies in West Michigan that are foreign owned, and they might not need somebody who is going to move here to purchase a house for a year or two, but you certainly can help them find housing, work with property management companies, it, maybe get a referral through that somehow, um, and who knows, maybe they will stay, refer their other people who are coming who may be buying a house here. Um, okay. Um, so again, identifying your niche. You, maybe you want to specialize on re retirees or second home purchasers, okay? Right now, currently, we back to those 2050 statistics, right now, 8.2% of the world's population is 65 or older. It's gonna more, it's gonna more than double by 2050. A lot of Europeans, a lot of Americans are very, very concerned about maintaining their same living standards once they retire. They're concerned about, they're concerned about stretching their dollar. Now, picking up and retiring overseas, obviously it's not going to be for everybody. But you know what? These countries easy direct flights from Atlanta, Houston. If I'm flying to Florida, what difference does it make if I fly another, you know, hour and a half to get to get someplace where the cost of living is cheaper, maybe in Mexico, you know, like the area of San Miguel, big expat community, English is speak, spoken very um, fluently, and um, there's certainly, maybe you can, for the price, you can afford a maid, a cook, and you still have your, you know, two or three bedroom house there. Um, Costa Rica, stable political system, um, easy to meet visa requirements. Uh, dis Costa Rica offers uh, discounts on travel, restaurants, and even entertainment for retirees. Property prices in Costa Rica are getting, are increasing. Um, they're not as cheap as they were, but still um, a good place for, um, for retirees. Very stable um, political system there. Panama, English is widely spoken. They use the American dollar. They have great incentives for, uh, for retirees. You get um, your pension requirements. So if you, even if you get like $1,500 or $2,000 a month, for your kind of retirement income, you can get a visa, visa requirement and live, and live very, very well in Panama. In, like I said, um, English is why a lot of the big stores, um, things very similar to the US. 
Nicaragua is kind of up and coming. Um, very good cost of living, but there are some major, major developers who are building communities um, in Nicaragua, well, they're, they're kind of self-contained for retirees. They're gonna offer healthcare clinics right, in, right on site. They offer gym, fitness centers, um, activities, much that you would see for um, kind of some senior living centers here. Ecuador, uh, moderate climate, very good hospitals, refunds on sales tax, and uh, retirees can require, um, can qualify for their national health system. So, kind of U.S. retirees. Places for retirees worldwide, the United States. Um, again, back to our stable political climate, English, you know, our stable currency. Um, kind of on the downside, a lot of people have a hard time getting, um, you know, maybe difficult getting permanent resident status. So they may retire, spend six months of the year here, and then go back to their, um, their native countries. But Turkey and U.S., you can live in Turkey for about one-third the cost that you can in the United States. Morocco is very popular for uh, Europeans. It's a very short flight away, very affordable housing, and a low uh, tax rate. Malaysia, um, very, very strong infrastructure, technical infrastructure system, so um, communications are very easy. Physical infrastructure is uh, also very strong. Great health care um, healthcare system, low cost of living, great tax incentives. Thailand, um, a lot of Americans, a lot of expat, big expat community there. Big yoga community. If you're into yoga, okay. There you go. Um, retirement age for visa, if you're, if you're 50, you can re um, qualify for a uh, retirement uh, visa there. So, excellent health care. So. Step three, okay, here you are, making your marketing uh, plan. So what are we going to do? Um, what face to, we're going to start with face-to-face -face client marketing. What groups are you going to join? You could join the Swedish American Heritage Society if you wanted to. Um, there's a lot of other cultural groups uh, in West Michigan. I'd suggest you, you can, you know, just Google them. Um, the Hispanic Society. There is the Son, you know, Sons of Italy. Sister City organization with Grand Rapids. You can check that out. If you don't feel like doing that, I'd suggest you go down to the Festival of uh, Festival of Arts at the beginning part of June, walk around with your Slovaki and take note of all of the cultural and ethnic food restaurants down there and start talking to them. Make some connections. So cultural groups, professional groups, um, what do you want to get involved with? Chamber of Commerce, did you know there's a Michigan India Chamber of Commerce? There's the His West Michigan Hispanic Chamber of Commerce? kind of some professional groups that you want, might want to, uh, to join. What seminars or workshops, workshops do you want to offer? Let's say you decide to make your niche that uh, particular cultural organization. What about, as I said, those immigrants, it's part of buying, it's a part of the American dream and they're going to buy, they're going to purchase homes at a higher rate than the normal U.S. born citizens. So maybe you want to offer a first-time homebuyer workshop in a professional, in a particular cultural organization. Seminar for uh, retiring overseas. I had a book here someplace. Um, I was going to show you. Cashing in. I don't know where it is here. You're welcome to come over here and take a look at these maybe on your way out. But um, cashing in on a second home in Central America. We've got some ideas on um, if you want to deal with retirees. Presentation to foreign investors. Again, maybe if your niche is you've got a lot of experience with investment properties, maybe you want to put together a webinar, develop your web page, focus and target um, foreign investors. Are any of you familiar with the EB-5 visa program? Somewhat? Um, another thing, there are target, um, basically this is kind of a fast track to getting sort of permanent resident status 
in the U.S. There are certain targeted economic areas. I think there's 12 in Michigan. And a foreign investor, if they invest 500, I think a minimum of $500,000 and are able to create 10 jobs, um, they can qualify for this visa. So it's, in a way, some people will say it's like buying a, vi <laughs> buying a visa, but you've got to prove some economic um, viability to that too. So, but maybe you want to do, put together a webinar and talk to, you know, that way you can attract people all over the world who are interested in coming to the United States. Face-to-face -face networking um, continue. What events to attend? If nothing else, I would strongly, strongly encourage you to come to the National Association of Realtors um, convention in, you know, next one is coming up in November. Fantastic networking opportunities. In their area where they've got, um, you know, what's it called when they have all the um, people who display trade show. trade show, yes. This whole section of the trade show room is dedicated just to international. It's the International Pavilion. And you will see people there, real estate professionals from all over the world. They, um, for example, I mean, the last time I was, you'll see the Mexican, whatever the Mexican associate real estate is, trade association, they'll have a desk set up. Brazil will have one. You'll meet people, developers from Costa Rica or Panama. The Europeans will have um, like a trade show booth set up, all kind of within this uh, international area. Thing that's really great about this too is that they uh, NAR schedules um, certain networking events so that if you're interested in a particular region of the world, um, they'll say open networking for Europe. And there's a table and a setup, and everybody who's interested in the Europeans will show up. The, if you're interested in dealing with that culture, sit down, start making those connections and talking to these other real estate professionals. South, you know, same thing, South America, Asia, fantastic networking opportunities. The NAR convention also has an international night out black tie gala, great place to network and meet people. And um, there's a lot of international committee meetings um, that go on. You don't have to be necessarily a committee mem member. There's the Global Alliance's um, advisory committee and they talk about kind of what's going on in um, kind of international real estate trends, just sit there and listen. And you never know who you, you might sit next to. So really, people from all over, all over the world. Business trade shows might be um, an event you want to attend. Specific real estate conventions. You know, why not your next trip to Mexico why don't you maybe coordinate that with the Mexican real estate convention? You could do that. While you're there, maybe you, in advance, make some contacts with some uh, Mexican real estate professionals. Sit down, talk, say, call them in advance, tell them what you want to do. Hey, I just want to sit down and talk. I want to learn more about the Mexican market. How can I help you market some of your properties um, to the U.S.? Um, some great ideas there. The other, my, what is that, I'm Michael? Waiting all day to find out. <laughs> all right. So this is even hard for a French major to say, but the ABC stands for the it's the Federation Internationale des Agents de Bien Conseil et Immobilier. So those of you who speak a French might have got a little bit of that. So it's it is a worldwide um, real estate association. The last World Congress was held in Luxembourg in May, which I attended. Again, fabulous, um, fabulous connections, you know, right there. You'll meet developers, you'll meet real estate brokers, agents, architects, um, all over through the, um, throughout the, throughout the world. I sat next to a person from Mexico 
on a bus. We were going to an event, and he said, where are you from? I said, I'm from Michigan. He said, oh, I used to, you know, my family owned a home in northern, in more, northern Michigan. We spent our summers up there. So, um, again, you don't have to tr attend their World Congress. I was at an event in Chicago, very active U.S. chapter. They've got uh, meetings in Washington, D.C. and various places, but too, another great place for uh, networking. Obviously, online networking, Facebook's good, but it's not the only one. Look, if you're interested, interested in a particular country, look and see what other social networks are available outside the U.S. Pick your niche, make information, post uh, information on LinkedIn, Twitter. Developing an international website may be a good way for you to get started. Um, if you do that, a couple of points. Avoid technical jargon that doesn't translate real well or certain phrases that might not <laughs> translate real well. Um, you might want to include foreign currency exchange rates and uh, possibly metric conversion charts. Other things, you can uh, advertise your properties on some global websites. Juai.com is a huge, anybody heard of that one? Chinese website. Your listings will be um, tran your listings will be translated into Chinese, um, and you will be the contact. So you're reaching a whole. And you know what? They're they're buying properties. So Vivian is another one. Worldproperties.com is another one you might want to consider. So um, professional networking. Work with your allied resources immigration attorneys. I bet if you went to the State Bar Association of Michigan and asked for a list of all the international um, or the immigration attorneys in Michigan, you could probably get that. In fact, I know you can because I've done that. So there's some great professionals if you can form those networks. They will be a good source of referrals for you too. International tax attorneys. By the way, we are going to have an immigration attorney and a tax attorney coming and speaking at, um, in the next few months here. Lenders, translators, these are all kind of professionals that maybe you don't know the answer to, but you can refer them to uh, these different individuals. Mark, also part of your marketing plan include economic development agencies. As I said, some of the networking in, with agents in other countries. Local, culturally diverse businesses. You know, this sounds kind of funny, but you know, maybe your local chi favorite Chinese takeout restaurant. You know, if you introduce yourself and maybe periodically drop off market reports to their establishment and even ask to put a link of their business on your website, again, you're building that rapport. That's a connection for you. Look at, I mean, there's a ton of, I mean, if you drive around Granite, there's a ton of ethnic markets, ethnic restaurants. Start making those connections. NAR resources, realtor.org uh, global, huge, huge, huge. Write that down, highlight it, because this is where you're going to want to go for a lot of information. These reports that um, I showed you here can be found there. There is. If you want information on real estate, how real estate is sold, what real estate licensing requirements are, what the process for purchasing a home in any country, they've done research. They've partnered, I think, with the University of Denver to do a global, res um, global res real estate project. So almost any country in the world that if you've got people coming in and you're meeting them from India, you know, it wouldn't hurt to go out there and check on that website and find out what the process is so you know what they're familiar with before they come here. There are um, President's Liaisons, um, as Michael said, I'm the liaison to Belgium. Uh, reach out to those people. You can find them uh, on the NAR uh, global web page. Cooperating, cooperating associations, um, these are associations that NAR around the world, um, I want to say maybe 80 different associations in si over 60 countries, NAR has bilateral agreements 
with these uh, other associations. Talk to them, introduce yourself, and um, see what you can do to help them. Ambassador associations, think of sister city organizations here. So they may act as kind of the liaison. Let's say you want to, um, I think the, for example, Seattle um, Association is the ambassador association to, to Japan. So if you want to find out some more information on Japanese real estate, reach out to those associations. Um, okay, resources we have here at GRAR. Um, our committee has been working on developing a resource library. Coming soon, it's going to be online. We're going to give um, some tips and um, some professionals, maybe listing language services, some links to maybe some of the other cultural organizations. And um, look for some more whatever we can come up with with our international committees. So I know we're all very excited. We've been um, you know, putting together this series, but hopefully over the next few years we'll have some more fun international either networking or uh, learning opportunities. So um, other things, cultural organizations in West Michigan, I mentioned that. Ethnic Heritage Festival, that's down at the library every January, February. And um, some recommended reading. Know your clients. Like I said, I've got a bunch of books up here if you want to just peruse them. Um, learning about some of the cultural aspects of um, dealing with some of our international folks. So there you go. Look at almost 1.30. <laughs>